Hello everyone, welcome back to the PMF IS Current Affair Prelim Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik and this is your test number 8, part number 2. We'll be discussing the next set of the 20 questions from 21 to 40. And I really hope guys that you had a great time enjoying the first part and you guys must have learned something new. So similar kind of thing and similar approach we are going to see in this particular video. But one last time i'm telling you this is a high time you should start practicing the mcqs guys if you have not done yet then please go out and check out the prelim test series by pmf is the link is given in description below at a very special price of just 499 you can still practice 1000 high quality mcqs and you can boost up your score really really well in the upcoming prelims exam now if you look at the question 21 which was asked in your test the question is straight away with respect to the Indian National Young Academy of the Science called the INIAS. Now this was recently news because it has held one of its annual councils. And few things you need to learn about. As the name says a lot, it says it's a National Young Academy for the Science. So you, you can expect there must be something related to young scientists of the India. At least this much understanding we need to have in our mind before we read uh, this kind of statement. So what exactly is this Indian National Young Academy of Science and why it was in news? Because it recently held its ninth annual general body meeting. So one thing is clear, it happens on an annual basis. But what make the India so, so special? This body is really special because it's the first and the only recognized academy for the young scientist of India. Other than that, you do not have many such kind of institutions. It was founded way back in 2014 and it aims to create a vibrant community of the young scientists who can really contribute to the scientific advancements, even the policy formations and the public engagement. And for that purpose, this particular institution to make sure to, uh, to achieve all its aims and objectives, this particular organization actually offers the mentorship, the advocacy for science technology and it also fosters the interdisciplinary research. That is the framework with which INIAS works in our country. It's been 10 years, it's, it's working pretty well in the last 10 years. And if anybody wants to be a member of this particular organization, the membership has certain eligibility. For example, the applicant should at least be holding a PhD degree it can mean any uh, discipline of pure and uh, applied sciences and engineering or maybe having some MS, MD degree in medical sciences. That person can be a member of this body. Second thing, it talks about the young academy, talks about the young scientist of India. So there as well, because it says the, the anybody who wants to be a member must be less than the 40 years of the age as of 31st December 2023. And mainly this body has two very famous activities. One is called Saranj and another is called the Science Padrack. So these two are very well-known activities that relates to the INIAS. So in, now if you look at the question, both statements looks absolutely okay, absolutely uh, normal. Both statements are correct. Yes, it's the first and only body for young scientists and having the age criteria less than 40. But very cool. This, this question is easy. I would recommend it is easy because very straightforward question. Answer is C. But be careful. You have lots of facts involved in this question. You cannot simply guess the age. So be very careful with the number here. You may get a question here which says young scientist means less than 35, less than 45. So anytime it can be manipulated. And when, when any statement says first and the only so, of course, you really have to think it twice or thrice. So, be careful with these kind of words. Here, yes, you can attempt it if you have read about it. Straightforward question. But be careful fact-oriented question, guys. That brings us to the next question, 22, which, talk, which talks about the mission Utkarsh. It was in news very much uh, recently. Utkarsh is about what? This Utkarsh is about controlling anemia among the adults and girls using the Ayurvedic interventions. Yes, that is your right answer. Utkarsh mission has to do with anemia. So very first thing, it is not about uplifting the urban poor, poor student of the urban schools, not. 
it is not at all about promoting the self help groups it is about the anemia and how we can help the adolescent girls coming out of that now this kind of question guys i always say these kind of questions are easy for those who have at least read it once but talking about mission utkarsh it is actually very much in news and it is very famous throughout india so i put in it in the medium category you 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 can still uh, attempt this question but yes it could be attempted because it's a straight forward question without any twist or turns and there is absolutely nothing wrong with the statements talking about the utkarsh whenever you think of mission Ut utkarsh you think about the two ministries one ministry of ayush and number two ministry of women and child development and it is logical why the two ministries are involved because you are talking about controlling anemia okay among the adolescent girls that explains why the ministry is uh, ministry of women and child development right and you are going to control the anemia using the ayurvedic interventions and that explains why we have ministry of ayush involved initially this project will be launched in the five aspirational districts across the five states as a pilot project please remember mission utkar still so far it has not been implemented across the india initially because you know anemia is a big problem like in in india uh, every third or every fourth women or girl has the anemia we'll talk about it definitely we'll discuss little bit about the anemia as well but you know this this is a big problem especially in the in the teenagers uh, the girls of of this country the women of this country we have this very percentage of anemic patients anemia is when you are, when you have a uh, less hb in your blood when you have red, less rbcs in your blood uh, and in very simple it's called the the lack of blood in the body so when your hb becomes really low you have you have the problem of anemia and it, it has many other causes as well we'll talk about that that the point here is that initially to get the results and to test the model to test how we are going to uh, implement the anemia control measures using ayurvedic interventions we are relying solely on a five aspirational district aspirational those districts which are the backward they are doing the worst in case of anemia numbers and that's why we chose those five high aspirational districts across the five states okay this is absolutely important guys but the over this uh, mission is the nutritional improvement among approximately 95000 adults and girls in anemia prone districts of our country so very dedicated mission very important mission just to give you little bit idea about anemia because you may have a question coming on anemia as a stand alone question as well so please remember you think of anemia it's a common blood disorder why am, am i showing saying so because common blood disorder because in anemia there is a surely reduction of number of the rbcs or there is a decrease in the amount of the hemoglobin the protein that actually carries the oxygen in the blood so any of this situation you have the problem of anemia blood causes especially if there is iron deficiency in the body because iron is absolutely essential for the rbcs red blood corpuscles production without without iron in your body your body is not going to generate enough rbcs or if your body is having vitamin deficiency especially lack of vitamin b12 or and that's why folic tablets are given to the anemic girls you remember that right so b12 and and the foliates are the two essential uh, vitamins that is needed to cope up with the anemia or if you are suffering from some kind of chronic disease like you know if you are if anybody is uh, having chronic conditions especially with respect to kidney or inflammatory disorders then also the production of the rbc rbc get affected or blood loss especially during the menstruation that's why anemia is more common in girls than in boys because there is always excess blooding in case of girls due to menstruation and other kind of issues right and it can also be this uh, anemia can also be Uh, uh can also come to the generation due to genetic condition due to inherited disorders it can be transferred from the parents to the to the children so that can also be a case with anemia it has a worse effect on health because if you are not having enough iron enough rbcs in a body you are going to see the reduced physical performance there would be poor very bad cognitive 
memory issues can be there and there is always going to be a difficult tough life for that that kind of persons and yes in certain situations severe anemia can actually lead to other complications like heart problems the organ damages and even death in the circumstances so so definitely guys talking about anemia is absolutely important next question we have is with respect to the one nation one election so right now the whole country is in election fever we know we are we are having uh, the uh, lok sabha elections it's already it has already started uh, so uh, yes so this, this is a very much talked about topic one nation one election it used to be there in the country initially for few years and then the cycle breakdown but we need to know everything about the one election one uh, nation one election process why it is called one election it means i am thinking of synchronizing the elections of the lok sabha and the vidhan sabha together the word one nation one election means this structuring the indian cy election cycle in such a way on the same day if i am going to go uh, to give a vote the same day i can give a vote for the lok sabha as well as the vidhan sabha of course the two responses are to be uh, to be registered separately but on or, or but majorly on the same day that actually can save i mean there are positive things there are negative things also if you are having one nation one election you are going to save lot of machinery you are going to save lot of time of the of the defense personnel your own time and you are also going to save lot of money of the exchequer state exchequer money can be saved because you know conducting election in our country is always very expensive guys right but again there are some issues like some like majority of the of the voters in india they may not be able to understand what what is important as a lok sabha issue like a national issue and what is important as a as a state issues so sometimes these kind of complications are there and what happens if uh, any government falls in between how will you maintain that cycle so there are a lot of uh, logistic complications also we'll talk about that now please understand this uh, this question you to figure out which statements are the correct one okay now i'll discuss them and then we'll come back to the question so like i just mentioned the one nation one election actually means uh, synchronizing the lok sabha and vidhan sabha elections together please remember as a star mark when i say one nation one election it actually exclude it does not the local governance election does not include the elections of the panchayat or state municipalities or not even the by elections they are not they are not included as a part of one nation one nation one election no because separately the state election commissions they are responsible for conducting the elections of the panchayat municipalities right they are not the one nation one election so this is actually important point you may have a question coming where you may be uh, tricked by the upsc which says it includes these kind of elections as well so one nation one election is not like something which is alien to us initially for the few years in 191952567627 there was a form of one nation one election but then the cycle broke cycle broke for the first time in 1959 when the government of india actually in kerala invoked the president rule under article 356 and from there the cycle broke now please understand this was this was a time why initially this was a time when uh, indian national congress was the only major party that was that was ruling the states and the center but you see after 1960s there was rise of the regional parties as well and that is why people uh, you know shifted their narrative people shifted their choice of the votes and when rise of with the rise of the regional parties more and more people started understanding the state issues separately than the national issues and probably this is this is why even today it is not that easy to conduct same day elections for the lok sabha and the uh, vidhan sabha now to make it work uh, recently the government of india formed a member committee that can actually examine the possibility of this so called one nation one election and with the and uh, under the chairmanship of our former president ramnath kovind sir and this committee was formulated okay now this is not the first time this has been done i mean there are so many committees which were formed with respect to the feasibility of the one nation one election in fact if you look at the election commission of 1983 there also they they said that yes there should be the there should be some system to conduct the lok sabha and the vidhan sabha 
election simultaneously this was this was what election commission of india said officially in 1983 in fact 1999 the low the law commission 177th uh, 170th report also said that yes there should be simultaneous holding of the two elections that is recommended by the law, law, law commission as well and there are many uh, such reports you have many parliamentary standing committees then you have the niti ayog paper to, uh, uh, 2017 they all favor this whole idea understood but again you need to have to mobilize it to actually do that of course you need to amend five articles in indian constitution of course and please remember you may have mcq on this also upsc because now upsc is more into the uh, con, uh, you know more than the factual part it's more into the conceptual part upsc may ask you that in order to have one election which of the following articles needs to be amended so you have to amend everything from 83 85 172 174 and 356 and if you if you are really interested kindly read about these topics they are absolutely important but in nutshell to amend the constitution to implement one nation one election um, the constitutional requirement is that such an amendment must be ratified by at least minimum 50% of the states till 50% of the states do not ratify that such law will not be implemented or will not be considered as a law so now if you go back to the question guys here all the three statements are absolutely clear now i do not see any trouble in this question it's a very obvious question of polity which was in use for so many times and look at the options options are pretty simple without any twist and turn very easy question i think could have been attempted without any trouble guys now number 24 question 24 talks about the finance commission okay now very important election body and sorry very important constitutional body we have the finance commission of india but straight away look at this article guys it says the finance commission is constituted by president of india every 5 year under the article 324 why we know it absolutely wrong finance commission article is article 280 because 324 is very famous 324 talks about the election commission of india so definitely we cannot make such kind of mistake okay now this is one thing so for sure i am i am very much sure that first statement is going to be the wrong one what about the other statements let me tell you let me get uh, to the basics and i'll make you understand the things so far what when you think of finance commission of india you think of article 280 absolutely important with a star mark finance constituted by president of india another important thing for the mcq you may have this question straight away which of the following constitutes the finance commission the parliament the central government the president of india or election commission of india or could be anything right so you have of india it is done every 5 years or even maybe earlier that is the provision and please remember 324 do not mess with the finance commission 324 is exclusively dealing with the election commission of india this this article itself is very very important because we are having elections in our country this year okay guys so you have a chairman in that uh, followed by four other members which are appointed by the president itself now what is the major job of finance commission why it is constituted the major job is to make recommendations on distribution of the financial resources between the union and the state this is this is the primary function this is foremost important function of the finance commission it is it is the fc that is going to tell you that how all the financial resources which are there with the center is going to be distributed between the center and the states and recently we have got commission now i want i want you to uh, uh, tell me that uh, during the 15 finance commission it was it was decided that the share of the states from visible pool of taxes the states are going to get 41% share this is as per the recommendations of 15 finance commission but now we have got the 16 finance commission guys and 16th finance commission is going to make recommendations from 2026 to 2021 with arvind panagaria as the 16th finance commission commissioner of india now this itself is can be an important mcq 
okay now please understand so we have this 50, uh, we have this 41 percent kind of thing as a share between the center and the states now there are parameters and on what parameters you are going to give what which state how much money that depends on certain parameters if you look at the 15th finance commission you see it it talks about that you know 45 percent weightage is to be given from the income distance what is income distance guys it talks about the state having the maximum income and the state you know having the having a comparison with that or income state so every time that comparison is to be taken if you are at number four in terms of the income so from first to the fourth that based on that forces will be given to you based on 2011 census the population also we are considering 15 percent share to be given based on that your area how much area of the state because that 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 matters if you have to give the money to the state the area is also taken into consideration 15 percent forest and ecology because ultimately if you are doing well doing well on ecology you will get the 10 percent of the share and then you have other parameter like your your demographic performance your tech efforts based on all that so be careful you may have a question may have a question on these parameter also and not just the parameter but you may have to arrange these parameters as increasing or decreasing order so be careful about that now remember one thing guys when i when i say when i say the finance commission is going to recommend the divisible pool of taxes divisible pool of taxes includes all the corporate tax the personal income tax the central gst the central state of the igst everything is there except the two things the central pool of taxes include the cess and the surcharge means it means in simple words so the central government whatever cess or whatever surcharge that central government is going to receive central government is not with the states cess and surcharge exclusively going to remain with the central government guys and you must know the difference between the two what is a cess what is a surcharge cess is always both are like taxes on taxes cess is actually a dedicated tax on the overall tax for some specific purpose let's say my objective is swachh bharat abhiyan for Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, the government says, okay, I'm going to charge whatever the whole tax you are paying, I'm going to charge 0.5% cess on your overall taxations, right? So that is how I'm going to uh, uh, take from whoever paying the taxes, 0.5% of the tax is going to come to me as a cess. Now, this is the government has dedicatedly declared that I'm collecting this cess for the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan. So government is bound to spend money on that dedicated thing. You can't divert your cess. For surcharge, it's a general tax on tax. Government does not disclose on what particular thing I'm going to spend it, but government just collect it and then spend on miscellaneous things. So that is a basic difference of cess and surcharge, but both are not going to be shared between the center and the state. Remember that exclusively, guys. And please remember, Though the recommendation you have just uh, understood, the 15th Finance Commission recommended that 41% of the share of the central divisible pool to be shared with the state, the states actually receiving only 32%, not 41%. Because the government is charging more cess and surcharge and government is not liable to share, share it with the states. That, that is actually what's happening. So now if you look at the question guys, if you go back to the question, you look at the question. So clearly my first statement was wrong. Even fourth is wrong. The states are not receiving 32, uh, 40, uh, 42% guys. The state is receiving 31, 32%. So clearly the states are uh, they're receiving less than by the 15th finance commission. Second and third are absolutely correct without any issue guys. I would say this again was a was not a was not a tough question guys it was an easy question very easy basic question on finance commission that you guys can expect you can also expect question coming about the members okay so four members are there no 
every member has to have some certain kind of qualification so do read about the qualification eligibility of the members of the finance commission as well that is again going to be important so you can attempt it without any trouble answer would be only two okay now that guys question number 25 what question 25 says question 25 exclusively talks about the Ladakh protest which is already a burning issue in our country so considering the Ladakh protest consider the following statements exclusively you know one of the major demands of the Ladakh protest is that Ladakh wants itself to be added in under the sixth schedule of our constitution you know the sixth schedule talks about the tribal population guarding the tribal rights of the people of India what exactly is the right right thing we need to know first we'll, we'll uh, understand the whole issue we'll come back to the question guys so we know about the Ladakh protest and if you have not yet read then please go and check out Ladakh is actually under heavy protest for so many reasons and the major protest is with respect to the full statehood to the Ladakh and number two preserving its identity in the constitution by adding it into the sixth schedule of our of our Indian constitution now please understand the major five demands are right in front of you you may have this question you may have this question that which of the following are the major demands of the Ladakh protest that we have seen recently so statehood complete because right now after 370 abrogated Ladakh is now a union territory not a state so the Ladakh says they want a complete statehood status they want to safeguard themselves under the sixth schedule now this is going to be important discussion for us it also talks about reserving the jobs for the youth of Ladakh, talks about a separate parliamentary constituencies for the two parts of the region, the Leh and the Kargil. It also talks about extended Ladakh's territorial control up to Gilgit, Baltistan in POK and reserved seats for the area. Now, considering these kind of demands and protests, the Ministry of Home Affairs, clearly they have set up a high-powered committee to look into the demands and the feasibilities of the Ladakh protest. But why the sixth schedule? Why? Why they're demanding the sixth schedule wala part? Because Indian now there's a problem, guys. There's a problem. Why? We understand the sixth schedule is about protecting the tribal people's interest. And you know, in Ladakh, you have majority of the tribal people. That's fine, that's true. But you know what the problem is? The problem is the Indian constitution. As per the Indian constitution, it reserves the six schedules exclusively for the northeast region of India. And that is why currently under the sixth schedule, there are only the tribal areas of the four states which are protected, the ATMM, the uh, Assam, Tripura, Meghalaya, Mizoram. Only the northeastern states to be a part of sixth schedule and all other parts of the countries are actually covered under the fifth schedule. Fifth schedule also talks about the tribal people. But when it comes to sixth schedule, it exclusively talks about the northeastern region guys. And that is why Ministry of Home Affairs is making Ladakh understand what is possible. There are challenges why putting Ladakh in six schedules is not feasible because constitution itself says the six schedule to be used only for the northeastern states. And that is a big problem, big tussle we have. Now, where under the sixth schedule, there is always a freedom and autonomy to the tribal people. How? Because if you are you have your own autonomous district council, the ADCs. There are 10 such ADCs right now in these four states that I just mentioned. And this autonomy autonomous district councils have some legislative, judicial, administrative autonomy within a state. You see, that is the part. And everywhere, everywhere you are having this council. Any district council under the sixth schedule is going to have at least 30 members and out of that 30, 30 members of whom governor is nominate going to nominate 4 but 26 remaining 26 are to be elected on the basis of adult franchisee that actually gives more representation if every is going to have 30 members it is actually going to give democratic representation democratic representation to whom to the tribal people of that area they have their more voice in the policy making and that's why six schedule is demanded every time 
any any uh, part of the state talks about right that is the that is the reason guys now in this case i see no problem at all so yes ladakh protest is about safeguarding the rights under the sixth schedule yes sir and uh, yes sixth schedule is all about the northeast india yes and uh, 30 members are there four by governor 26 to be elected on the basis of voting adult franchise on the basis of the voting that you and me does so yes in this case all the three are absolutely correct the question i would say it's a kind of medium level but not something that you could not attempt you can easily attempt or at least you can take a risk if you're not sure with the third one third one may give you a little bit trouble but at least you should be sure of the first and second very simple statements straight away being asked to you in your exam right okay boss so that takes us to the next point that is question number 26 talks about the formation of the states again very important question of the federalism of india now two things it talks about the formation of the state and the article where you can actually do that now be careful with the first statement what is article 2 it is not about this please remember it what clearly i'm talking about so when it comes to creation formation of the new states you actually have to go to article 3 of the indian constitution that actually gives parliament authority to undertake various actions regarding formation alteration dissolution of the states it is not the article 2 article 2 talks about admission establishment of the new states the parliament may by law admit to, into the union and established new states or something but when it comes to the parliament having power authority to form alter any state it is always article 3 article 3 is more powerful more comprehensive it is clearly more powerful and clearly more comprehensive thing and one interesting thing guys if if you have your bill if you are passing if you are if you want to create a new state if you want to have a formation of a new state or you want to alter the area of a state fine to do that any bill that talks about formation of the new states or the new boundaries of the state under article 3 the bill must be introduced it can be introduced in either house can you can introduce in Rajya Sabha introduce in Lok Sabha no problem but one condition such kind of bill always going to be introduced only with the prior recommendation of the president without president permission you cannot introduce such kind of bill only with the prior recommendation of the president you can do that and the president not of the state legislature may either accept or reject no problem no 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 problem at all so if you if you go to the question now you yeah now you can understand very well this authority this parliament authority of you know formation alteration dissolution it is not article 2 it is article 3 that takes place so first is technically incorrect i can eliminate the two the second being correct we have the answer as 2 1 this is important and yes this question not very straightforward i would put it in in, in a bit of tough category because this is a unconventional kind of question you don't really uh, read or talk about in depth about these things but you must but you should it was a tough question you can take a little bit of risk if you are not sure then you need to skip it's not easy to attempt this question because you have only two statements and very tight statements which can be really challenging at times next question is about the net borrowing ceiling of the states what is this nbc of the states and why kerala is so upset with the central government we need to learn on that we need to talk about that so recently the context is very simple guys recently the kerala government protested when when the central government imposed limits on its borrowings how much a state government can borrow there is a limit that center can put on a state individually because as a center you have this responsibility of of taking care of the entire uh, what you say uh, the fiscal deficit so as a central government it is your responsibility to make sure the any state government is not borrowing beyond its limits and capacities and when kerala government protested about the imposing of the limits on its borrowing so nbc clearly limit the borrowing of a state from all sources not just one two three you are going on the borrowing from all sources 
you can't go to the even to the open market borrowings you can't do that so center government has decided to deduct the liabilities on the public account of the states to arrive the nbcs and borrowing by the state government enterprise service out of the budget the state revenue deducted from the nbcs and that is where the state has to obtain and every time any state government if they want to raise some money they want to raise some uh, uh, you know capital they always have to obtain the consent of the center without the permission of the center no state government can actually borrow but why kerala is so upset the kerala is so upset because number one public debt of the state public debt of a state is under article 43 of the state list so parliamentary technically cannot legislate on the about the debt on the state as a state government it's a state subject and you know state subject central government or, or the parliament does not have any anything to say Secondly, the public account this whole raising the money from the market the public account falls under the purview of the state legislature as per six thus its liabilities should not be included in the nbc and that's why kerala says what the central government has done is not good it's not appropriate so technically if you see both statements are correct one two but do you see any connection between two and the one do you see any connection between the two no sir it is not so look at the question the question both statements are correct but they are not explaining each other correctly so center deducted liabilities on public account to arrive nbc fine the state government the public account fall under the purview of the state not under any purview of the center that is also correct but i do not see any connection between the two do you see any connection between the two no the two are state alone statements they are stand alone correct but not related to each other now in this case the answer is supposed to be b i would say this question was a little tough one it was a tough one guys you can only attempt it if you are very good with the convicts or at least you, you can take a risk in that case now if you are absolutely blank about it then what choice but to skip it because that can be really challenging for the new and average students talking about the next question guys which talk about the it guidelines 2021 rules with the reference to the amendments you have to talk about the it guidelines media ethics code of 2021 so few things we need to talk about and by logic we can rule out some of the other things so first thing is first what's the first thing guys the first thing is that we have recently seen in 2021 we got the rules and these it rules which made the intermediaries establish a grievance and redressal mechanism and remove the unlawful unfitting content with the speculated time frames and that is clear instruction to all intermediaries here all the internet service providers all internet service provider or all the platforms also so it rules clearly says if if like for example intermediary can be facebook it can be your instagram it can be any google account you know you see that even your whatsapp so basically the point is the government says that you have to make sure if there is any grievance redressal that that needs to be in place and very importantly in 2021 it act very strict changes were actually done in 2021 it act the government the social media platforms all these facebook amazon sorry facebook insta uh, snapchat or whatever the social media platforms are or the twitter all social media platforms required to provide technological solution to identify the first originator of the information risking the privacy why if government thinks that this particular message is not good not fit for the circulation so in that particular case yes the social media has to make sure it tracks the information of the first person who actually originated that information and all intermediaries are required to remove that misinformation or bad information within 24 hours of the complaint what is concern because that exposes the private individuals 
that shows such individual are in full partial nudity or any sexual act or something like that that needs to be taken down within 24 hours and these IT rules clearly said of IT rules of 23rd 23 there are two IT rules be careful one is 2021 IT rules and then you have IT rules 2023 so 2023 IT amendment rule provides for the establishment of the grievance appellate committee yes there has to be a grievance appeal committee and also remember one thing guys that this whole thing uh, of finding you know intermediaries and all every all of this framework was under ministry of electronics and it very obvious who else is going to deal with the digital or internet things it is it has to be ministry of electronics and the information technology very interesting now if you go back to the question you have certain things that you that, that really needs your attention what are these things please pay attention here first thing says that it was 2023 amendments making intermediaries establish grievance redressal mechanism fine this first statement is fine but when it comes to removing unlawful unfitting information was it 2023 amendment no sir the second part of the information was the it amendment rules 2021 so half statement correct half wrong this is not the right choice for us secondly you think apply your logic you are talking about the it industry information technology industry do you do you see any reason why home ministry needs to be involved in this so-called fact check unit is it the matter is it the domain of home ministry no sir for it i am supposed to have my maiti the ministry of electronic and it uh, uh, you know that is the ministry i should be looking at not the home ministry it is not the home ministry's job so clearly the first and the third very logically common sense wise you can eliminate the question was a medium one but you have got still got the right answer as b uh, like two as only one is the right answer a is the right answer so medium but yes very carefully you can still take a risk but make sure you are reading every line with logic without going to lose it somewhere so make sure you properly prepare it kunal kamra case i think i need not to say anything about it very very famous case he is a comedian Kunal Kamra is a stand-up comedian. We all we all know about him, and we knew uh, Kunal Kamra's case was a very infamous case that happened for, and and there were many instances also, and we all know about the feud that happened between Kunal Kamra and Arnab Goswami in the flight, and how he was debarred from uh, other flights, and so many other things were there. Yes, Kunal Kamra case is his case is actually talking about is it about the right to freedom of religion? No, sir, he doesn't talk about that. It's not at all about the text evolution. It's a he is a stand up comedian. So any stand up comedian can actually offend somebody by only his free speech. So make sure you remember the profession of Kunal Kamra is stand up comedian. That's why right of free speech is something that can actually put him in trouble. So Kunal Kamra case answer is C freedom of free speech. I think very straightforward uh, thing is there. So answer has to be C in this case. You know? This is this is absolutely straightforward question, guys. You without any trouble, without any issue with you. Question number 30 talks about the interim budget. Now please remember that two things are always confusing the students. Is it the interim budget, sir? Or versus second is the vote on account second is the vote on account now the two things are important now the question says now now there there is another question question 34 you are actually going to have the comparison of the two but right now the question is exclusively focusing on the interim budget only so let's focus on interim budget and then we'll come back and and it makes every sense why i'm talking about interim budget because this is our election year and this election year we have seen in february that interim budget was presented so what exactly is the meaning of interim budget guys please understand it is just a temporary financial plan covering the government expenses until the new government take place at the central level because we know especially during the election years we have got the interim budget presented by the finance ministry now interestingly whenever you are going to have this interim budget as, as a temporary financial plan 
it actually seeks even the interim budget seeks the parliamentary approval for the four month expenses because you see budget uh, you know is presented in february and elections are taking place in april and may you see that so obviously for some period of time the government needs to spend money and for that purpose four months expenses are approved in the parliament for the interim budget and that includes everything the salaries and ongoing programs and without the tax charges everything is there now remember one more thing in generally yes i know it is uh, specially presented in the election years but in general also interim budgets can be presented it's not like that every time we have election then only we have the interim budget interim budget are generally and normally presented when there is insufficient time for the parliament to approve the grants and debates changes in taxations when you don't have that time and when because in general the election years you don't have that much grant time and that's why you got the interim budget now what is a vote on account i'm not explaining you here it is a part of interim budget because then you will get confused i will be dealing about this interim budget versus vote of vote of account in question number 34 because there's a separate question on that but as of now remember vote on account is one of the sub part of the interim budget only clear everyone now if you go back to the question the only problem with the statement number a is this it says it's a temporary financial plan yes sir but is it seeking approval of less than two month expenses no how possible february march april may there are two more months so in generally interim budget gets the expenses of at least four months not less than two months so one statement is incorrect and look at the option there is only one and only one option which says statement one being incorrect so without even without even reading number two i can still get my answer as number d and yes second statement is correct it is it has to be correct of course as the option says it says that interim budget presented when there is insufficient times we already have seen that so please remember interim budget always apply your logic here because generally generally the new government forms somewhere in may somewhere in april may june july right so that is a time so clearly interim budget we have the four months of expenses not the two month expenses so this question i would say uh, it was a medium question but could have been attempted with with uh, with the uh, thanks to elimination and thanks to the obvious wrong statement of uh, the first statement right so understanding the two are absolutely important so i so let me know guys if you are clear up to this point now if you are clear up to this point we are going with the question number 31 now in question number 31 which is with respect to the court vacations very important topic guys with respect to the court vacation so what exactly the, it talks about the uh, court vacations with respect to the supreme court and the high courts okay now there are few things that you need to understand before attempting this particular question now when it comes to uh, the vacation period the vacation the whole structure of the vacations in judiciary you have to go back to the 1958 statute as per that statute vacation means the period during a year fixed by the supreme court rules with the prior approval of the president like how many number of vacations we are going to have in, uh, within a year uh, for supreme court how many vacations for the high court everything is decided but with the prior approval of the president this thing you need to remember guys and as per the current rule which is followed by supreme court you have uh, you have certain number of fixed vacations for example the supreme court of india it has only 193 working days which is like less than 200 of course so only 193 days you have the supreme court working within a particular year so usually we have uh, seven weeks vacation for the supreme court as a summer vacation one one week long vacations for dashara diwali and then we have a two weeks break at the end of december it's a standard practice it's not fixed it can be changed but this is as per the current practice when it comes to the high court of this country high courts are functioning for it approximately 210 days when it comes to the trial courts they are functioning approximately to 45 days and please remember as a matter of fact the subordinate criminal courts do not have any vacations 
but subordinate civil courts have some vacations but criminal courts are working 24/7 without any vacation without any break now if you go back to the question guys so clearly what first statement says is absolutely correct that you have to have a prior approval of the president that is correct but second please remember what it says it says supreme court working 210 days no sir it is the high court that works for 210 days supreme court working 193 days so clearly second statement is wrong and the right answer you have is only one straight away factual question easy could have been attempted without any trouble okay number of days is yes it's a factual one but you need to focus on that next question 32 is a very very famous case very famous verdict that we always refer to which is shreya singhal versus supreme uh, versus the union of india and this case is with respect to the right to freedom of speech and expression on the internet it is one of the most famous cases guys that every upsc aspirant must be must be aware of very straight forward question easily could be attempted if you have read about the shreya singhal case now what this case was all about just to give you a little bit more insight into the case this case is talking about the freedom of right to freedom of speech and expression on the internet okay i'm talking specially with respect to the digital space now the supreme court in this very famous case actually struck down the section 66a of the it act 2000 that particular section was with respect to restricting the online speech and supreme court clearly found that as unconstitutional because when you are restricting the online speech of any user you are straight away violating the right to freedom of speech which is guaranteed as a fundamental right under the article 19 of the constitution and that's why this case stands out for striking down that 66a of the it act straight question without any trouble then you have question number 33 now this question talks about the special address which is done by the president of india what you need to know about it please let's understand it very carefully and this is also a very easy question whenever i use the word now you have to go if you look at the article 87 it clearly mentions about the special address to the parliament by the president and you see here in our in our video in this particular video you have many questions with respect to the president because we believe in 2024 from the polity governor president parliament they are going to be extremely important topics now as per says after the commencement of the first each general election of the house the president is going to have a special address and other than the first session of each year of the of the parliament president is again going to have the first session as a special address the president shall address both the houses of the parliament the lok sabha and rajya sabha together and such an address is called the special address and it is also an annual feature please remember one thing under the article 87 the president address to to both the houses is is it's a constitutional obligation it's mandatory it's not as per the choice of the president it is written that president must have the first address of each year lok sabha rajya sabha and also the first session after the general election which you are going to see after 2024 general election of this country now very interestingly the article 86 says something extra about the special address as per article 86 says the president when it's he is he or she is addressing either house of the parliament that requires the attendance of the members plus it's it's a common practice there has been there has not been any occasion when the president has address either the house assembled together under the provision president may may not exercise that right it's a matter of choice and one very interesting and important thing that you need to remember whenever the special address of the president is going on till then no other business to be transacted in the parliament when he or she is speaking as a president of india to the other things that are required for a parliamentary system it means if at a time of the commencement of the first session of the year lok sabha has been dissolved rajya sabha has to meet then rajya sabha can have its session without president address but in case of the first session of each general election nothing else can take place 
until the president address happens it's a constitutional requirement nothing can be done about it and if you look at the statement guys straight away both statements are absolutely correct i mean special address is something which we see very commonly every year we see it and i think by the time you are preparing for the upsc you are quite aware of the special address that take place uh, uh, as per the constitution article 87 so do read 87 86 very importantly straight away question i think the level was quite medium but could have been attempted without any trouble answer is supposed to be c in this particular case now question number 20 34 that all of you must be waiting now this is the question i was talking about this is the question we are talking about the vote on account and the interim budget now this is a question where you have, you will see the comparison between the two and you will get more understanding Question 30, we already have discussed about the interim budget. Now you have to compare the two. What comparison you need to take, please understand. Both these terms are a very common mistake we do that we use as interchangeable terms. But they are different. They are not the same. And why, what, how they are different, you will understand right now. So during an election year, whosoever is the incumbent government, they cannot prepare, can't pre present a full union budget and it is for obvious reasons. I mean, nobody can be sure if they are return, going to return to the power or not. So, of course, during the election year, the government like, like this year 2024, the interim budget was announced because that is the budget of like uh, for the next four months. After six of the constitution, you have an account that is presented to meet the essential government expenditure for a limited period generally we have we have the so called for for the two months uh, when it comes to vote on vote on account and uh, interim budget is somewhere for the four months that we have that you will understand now talking about the interim budget what makes it different from the vote account interim budget contains both revenue and expenditure parts but the vote on account is only with respect to the government expenditure. It doesn't talk about the revenue part. Because see, interim budget is a kind of mini budget where you have to mention how much revenue government is expecting and how it is going to uh, use that money or spend that money. Vote account is a sub part of the interim budget and it is only about the expenditure part, not the revenue part. So one thing is very important. Please remember another interesting different be difference between the two. The interim budget is valid throughout the year, but vote on account is only for two to four months max, mostly two, but max four months. It is not has a validity of a complete year. Interim budget is properly discussed and then has to be passed in the Lok Sabha like any other budget, but vote on account passed without formation and it is, it is mostly as per the will of the incumbent government. Now, again, if there is any changes in the tax regime, that changes in tax regimes can be proposed in interim budget without any problem, while the changes in tax can't be proposed into vote on account because it doesn't talk about revenue. Tax is a part of revenue part, isn't it? And since interim budget talks about revenue expenditure both, so obviously the tax changes are to be included and are to be proposed in interim budget. But since vote on account talks about only expenditure, so, vote on account is not going to have any changes in the tax regime. Very basic differences that you can see here and this is something you have to remember for the exam and do expect question coming on interim budget vote on account this year, this year being an election year, obviously guys, right? So, barring the exception of the first one, you see 2, 3 and 4 are incorrect because it says the interim budget vote on account both are valid throughout the year. No, sir. Vote on account is valid only to 2 to 4 months. It says vote on account interim both can pass without formal discussion. Only vote on account is passed with without formal discussion. For interim budget, you need to have a proper discussion. Then it needs to be passed in the Lok Sabha. And then it says the vote on account Lok Sabha proposes tax regimes. Not sir. Vote, vote on account is not about any taxation, not about revenue. It is done only in the interim budget. So the two things are inter-exchange. The level of the question, I would say it was a medium question and I think this, this uh, could have been attempted or at least you can take a risk because these two are very common topics that are always in the news for some reason or the other. And since you have lot of books, 
talking about vote on account interim budget very directly, I don't see any problem in that. So here the right answer is supposed to be only one in this particular case. Okay. Now that brings us to the question number 35. Question talks about the deputy chief minister, which you are seeing very much in news these days. Every possible, every state government are having now this practice of having deputy chief ministers for some reason or the other. But very interestingly, do you think deputy chief minister is a constitutional post? No, sir. In our constitution, there is nowhere mentioned about the constitutionality of the deputy chief minister. We only have the constitution only talks about chief minister. It's a political post and mostly the political parties, they appoint deputy chief minister to at least make some people happy so that they don't really go against the party and you have one chief ministers by some couple of deputy chief ministers. And please remember, it, it, it is also like it's, it's, it's not a rule. You can have only one deputy CM. No, that's not the case. You have seen in many states like for example in Andhra, there used to be four to five chief uh, deputy chief ministers. And many states you have two deputy chief ministers like we have in case of uh, 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 in case of Maharashtra also in case of M Madhya Pradesh also. So you so it's not a practice. I mean you can have n number of and this purely depends uh, on the chief minister. The appointing deputy CM is also not a task of the governor because it's not constitutional. No? Appointing a deputy chief minister, how many to be appointed? It all depends on the chief minister himself. Governor is not involved in the process. Very simple question, very common question. Here, none is correct, easy, could have been attempted by you anyhow. Because this is something you see after every election, the things are happening, guys. Okay, So it's purely a political post, remember, and not explicitly mentioned anywhere in our constitution with respect to that. And there is no fixed tenure also. Uh, Maharashtra has two deputy CM, I told you, Andhra has the five deputy CM. So yeah, can be done anyway. Next question number 36 talks about the autoimmune diseases. Here are the list of the five diseases. Are they autoimmune or not? First, you need to know what is an autoimmune disease. And then you can decide if these are autoimmune or not. Make sense? Now, if you look at the question, autoimmune disease, first to make it understand in a simple language, autoimmune diseases means when our immune system mistakenly target the healthy cells and tissues in our body and starts deteriorating those tissues and cells of our body. This autoimmune disease unfortunately is more common seen in females than you compare to the males. And, and if you talk about the examples of such autoimmune disease where our immune system attacks us only rather attack, attack, attacking the pathogens. You have all these examples of, let's say, the rheumatoid arthritis. Then you have the systematic lupus erythematos. You have the type 1 diabetes also, multiple sclerosis. You have the celiac disease. You have the Hashimoto's thyroiditis. You have the psoriasis. You have inflammatory bowel disease. All these examples are the examples of autoimmune disease. And it is very dangerous. It is very dangerous because many times if anybody is having autoimmune disease, there is always a risk of developing another autoimmune disease. If, if by chance you are suffering from one, you have other autoimmune disease following because once your immune system becomes malfunctioned, if it is not functioning as per the normal uh, uh, you know, uh, process, then there are chances of having multiple immune diseases that actually complicate the health of any individual. So here you have all the names guys we have just discussed. So yes, this was a tough question. I understand. In case you are not sure, I recommend you to skip it because this is not a common question and you really have to be a doctor kind of knowledge you must be having to attempt this kind of question. So yes, it was a tough question not to be attempted but to be skipped if you are not aware. Don't take risk in such questions here. The answer is all five. It was a tough one. I totally agree not very common question question number 37 talks about the national credit framework which is called the ncrf now what i need to know about the national credit framework that is important and then we'll come back to the question first thing is first you talk about the national credit framework who has developed this framework and what is this all about so national credit framework 
is about integrating the skills the training the skill development into school and higher education that is the first aim you have to remember you think of the national credit framework it's all about how you can integrate the training and skill development into the school education and higher one but this since i'm talking about the school and higher education is involved so it is the ugc it is the university grant commission that in 2022 developed this whole national credit framework very important thing guys this is the first thing you need to remember it belongs to ugc and secondly secondly when it comes to the academic bank of credits it is what this academic bank of credit it shall deposit credit awards by registered institutions into students accounts credits earned will be stored digitally into academic bank of the credit because as the name says name itself says it's going to be academic bank of credits so any credit if anybody is earning by integrating the training and the skills that credits earned are to be stored digitally digitally and where to be stored through the digi locker you know the digi locker is one of the prime uh, part of the of the india stack the all the digital products that india has and one of them is digi locker it's very important the academic bank credits can only be shared from institutions not directly from the students so few things you need to remember about it if you go back to the question you see the first statement is wrong because first statement says the national credit framework developed by national assessment and accreditation council i know i totally understand this statement looks correct if i have even i have to take a guesswork i probably would have marked it right because it seems to be right but the fact is fact it is the ugc that has developed this not the naac so yes this question was a tough one probably 90 percent students are going to do the guesswork and they are going to do the guesswork in the wrong way many students would be marking answer c i understand but in reality only second is correct so right answer is supposed to be two only not the c so tough one please risk it only if you have read about it otherwise this needs to be skipped because it has more chances of you trapping into the wrong one because the the options are designed in such a way next question is about the typhoid something we all have heard from our childhood days typhoid is it a viral function no sir typhoid is a bacterial function not a not a viral infection okay but about even beyond so first let's talk about the typhoid and the vaccines which are available in india with respect to that so think of the typhoid it is caused by the bacterium called as salmon salmonella typhoid not a virus like i pointed out how it is spread when it comes to typhoid the spread is very common through the ingestion of the food or water contaminated by the feces or urine of the infected people that is probably the most most common way of transmission of the typhoid when it comes to symptom we know high fever weakness stomach ache headache loss of appetite sometimes rashes very very common symptoms right and typhoid is very very common in the areas where you have poor sanitation in the areas having lack of the clean drinking water there you have the problems of typhoid and especially in southeast asia africa and some parts of the south america you have the common prevalence of typhoid now thankfully we have got a vaccine of that and the vaccine name is called type bar tv tcv what is this type bar tcv it's a conjugate vaccine now what is a conjugate vaccine you need to understand conjugate vaccines are basically those vaccines or those type of vaccines where you combine a weak antigen and you have another strong antigen they combine together and then they are inserted in you for a stronger immune response that is how the conjugate vaccine works and they are best especially if you have to talk they are best suitable for the infants from 6 months like like that way okay so it's a conjugate vaccine so many people will say what type of vaccine is a type bar it's a conjugate vaccine and this is remember this is the first clinically proven conjugate typhoid vaccine thankfully which india has developed very very important guys it's the bharat biotech that is developing it and supplying it all together now where the problem we have here in this question first though already i told you it's wrong second is correct but see look it says the type bar tcv it's, it is an injectable inactivated vice, vaccine was it inactivated no 
the word tcv c itself says it's a conjugate vaccine and you know the meaning of conjugate where you have weak and strong antigens combined together for a stronger immune response not inactivated by uh, you know vaccines are the part of it so clearly this question which how many correct only one is correct sir question i would say medium question but definitely the third one is going to be problematic first and second are easy statements you all know that third is going to trouble you so you can take a risk definitely but with lots of question and try to recall these kind of facts in the exam because upsc will tr trick you whenever you have a question coming out the vaccines be careful by what methodology that vaccines are being created very important guys question number 39 talks about the oral rehydration salt the or about it and we know very well the ors is used to treat dehydration especially caused by diarrhea vomiting and excessive sweating and it's a perfect solution who recommended solution that consists of the electrolytes and glucose fine but where this protein come from ors does not contain proteins it has electrolytes and glucose it's a it's a perfect mixture of salt sugar and water so protein has nothing to do so that's why statement 2 is wrong first is very simple and i think this was a very easy question because we all have used ors in our households at some point of time so this statement answer is supposed to be one only very easy could have been attempted and i'm sure majority of the students must have attempted it in a right way looking at the composition guys so you know that it's a precise balance of water electrolytes and sugar that is the best composition you can relate with the ors and uh, this is recommended by the, the who and what particular salt it use it use sodium chloride the normal nacl you have the glucose you have the potassium chloride and even the trisodium citrate that are the common uh, formulations used in the ors so do read about it and next time make sure if by chance you are using ors make sure you read the components of such kind of things like you know whatever you are using uh, in a common household i mean no book or no class can tell you about the ors the thing is if you are aware of the common things that you are using around you uh, it's a general common science that upsc always ta targets to make sure if you are aware of your surroundings or not that brings us to the last question question number 40 was with respect to the global initiative on digital health gidh what is this global initiative guys let's understand so here you think of the who and g20 presidency so these two together the g20 group and who they jointly unveiled the global initiative on digital health and here it 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 operates as a who managed network platform and supported by g20 and there you have uh, the implementation for the sake of implementation of global strategy on digital health and it has a 30 5 uh, years plan from 2020 to 2025 that is a whole strategy or whole uh, plan is of 5 years and it is going to end in 2025 who here is important part why it serve as a secretariat of this particular initiative one thing number 2 when you think of gidh what is the aim why we have got this digital health kind of global mission because the aim is simple guys to address the need for the countries to establish the national digital health infrastructure appropriate governance policy competent health workforce and this particular strategy dedicatedly focus on various domains of digital health it talks about the telemedicine talks about the health information talks about e health talks about the m health and all ai applications are part of this particular initiative when it comes to implementation of gidh guys the strategy actually encourages the collaboration among the governments it's you know it has many stakeholders you you have the governments you have international organizations even the private sectors are involved along with civil societies now if you look at the question this was not a very common question but if you look at the question guys this statement this questions you have all the three as absolutely correct one all statements are correct answer is going to be c all three my recommendation for this kind of question even if you read if you read about the name everything is in name let me tell you so the name itself says a lot of things you have some global initiative on digital health 
you have something uh, relate to health and that to at a global level you must be having who involved it is very obvious that who is going to be part of it so first statement is very obvious and you think of digital health the keyword there are two keywords one is the global another keyword is your digital so you think of digital health I'm sure all of this are very obviously to be covered to be a part of digital health. And yes, when it comes to the implementation, because health is a very wide domain and the more stakeholders, the better it is for the outcome of such initiative. So I think by logic, by simply understanding the name, putting more presence of mind can help you solve this question. Though it was a medium level question, but I think you could have attempted this without any trouble because sometimes the options are very much self-explanatory as it was for the case of question number 40 guys so i really hope you have enjoyed the particular video and if you did then let me know in the comment section box see you guys very very soon with the part number three coming away my best wishes for the upsc 2024 aspirants keep practicing and score well in your exams take care god bless you jai